Thank you. <clears throat> I, I want to live in a world where I don't have to worry if whether or not there will be any planet left for our future generations. If we look at the timeline of Earth, no other species has modified this landscape the way we have done it. And that is both very exciting and worrisome. We have achieved the most amazing things as humankind. We went to the moon. We can orbit around the Earth. We invented computers and created the internet. And we made all this possible because we are able to understand and manipulate matter at its most fundamental forms. But it all has come at a cost. Currently, in the US, we obtain most of our energy from burning fossil fuels. We burn oil, coal, and natural gas to produce electricity, to power our houses and our devices. But by doing this, we also produce a molecule called carbon dioxide. We already know that when carbon dioxide gets emitted to the air in excess, it causes global warming. But we cannot obtain any energy from CO2, so we just release it because it is a waste for us. And it is also not a toxic chemical by itself. We can breathe it. It actually smells nice. And in fact, the smell of CO2 can be described as freshly baked bread. I learned about CO2 when I was in elementary school back in Mexico. And I was always intrigued by a molecule like this. I was always a very curious boy. Uh, and luckily, I was the son of an educator. My mother taught elementary school, so she let me unleash all my scientific curiosities. Uh, she encouraged me to read. So I read about CO2 and about dinosaurs and about Carl Sagan and that little pale blue dot that is our planet. Uh, I was also a Boy Scout, uh, and you may think that I was a nerd. Uh, <laughs> and you may think right, because being a Boy Scout in Mexico was really fun. <laughs> I learned about rocks, I learned about camping. I learned that we humans have a very special relationship with nature. And that in the words of Robert Baden Powell, we must try and leave this world a little better than we found it. And those words have stayed in my mind ever since I heard them for the first time when I was 12. Because I understood that it is our duty to protect our little pale blue dot, because it is our home. It was also in school when I learned about photosynthesis. And I hope you like my semi-technical drawing of photosynthesis, <laughs> which is the natural process in which plants take uh, water, CO2, and use sunlight to produce oxygen and to remove the CO2 from the air. We animals breathe it out and plants take it in, which keeps a balance that maintains the temperature of the atmosphere steady, making this planet habitable. Unfortunately, we release so much CO2 from burning fossil fuels that we've altered this balance. And right now, all the plants on Earth are just not enough to restore the levels of CO2 to restore this balance. So we created global warming. And we are already seeing all the changes that have been predicted at the global scale, like hurricanes getting stronger every year, or the disappearance of beaches and islands from the rise of the sea levels, or the death of very important animals for our food production, like starfish, or bees, or coral reefs. And I can go on and on, but I'm here because I want to give an inspiring talk not a depressing one. <laughs> now, we have made similar mistakes in the past. We damaged the ozone layer so much that it also threatened our existence on Earth. The difference is that back then it was visible, the big hole over Antarctica. So we got really worried, and we did something about it. We created the Montreal Protocol, which has been the most successful international agreement uh, that helped help reducing the thinning of the ozone layer. But with CO2, it's more complex. We have the Paris Agreement, but we don't see a hole in the atmosphere, and we need to produce electricity. I remember growing up seeing chimneys with smoke coming out all day long and thinking, 
Is there anything that we can put on top of those chimneys to make those fumes less harmful? Is there anything that we could do to turn all that waste into something useful? Is there anything that I could do? So I became a scientist. And I learned that there is something we can do to fight the global warming threat. That we can develop new, exciting science that can help us to remove the CO2 from the air. Then we can make artificial systems that can emulate the natural process so we can adapt to global warming and fight it. I learned that we humans are capable of recreating photosynthesis in the lab with materials that are entirely made by us. When I became an independent researcher, I learned that I am not the first one to be concerned with this scientific challenge. That there is an army of very smart and very talented people that are just as worried as I am. And each of these scientists, technologists, and engineers has their very own unique and creative way to pursue artificial photosynthesis. And that I have to learn from them to see it on the shoulders of these giants, as Isaac Newton once said. In order to achieve artificial photosynthesis, we first need to understand how the natural process occurs, which happens in two steps in different parts of the plant at different times. The first step is called water splitting, in which a plant picks up a particle of light, which is pure energy, and uses that energy to rip apart two molecules of water. It produces oxygen, and it stores all that energy in chemical bonds as chemical energy. Now, to do this, most plants utilize red color. And it's going to sound weird, but that is why we see them green. Green is a complementary color of red, and we see the complementary colors. So what we want to do is to use more colors of the light uh, that come from the sun. Uh, these are the different types of light that come from the sun. Uh, a little bit more than half is visible light, which are all the colors of the rainbow combined together. And it's the energy that we want to use for artificial photosynthesis. 3%, about 3% is ultraviolet light, which has high energy and is very damaging for us. And most of it, it gets uh, filtered by the ozone layer. The rest is infrared light, which is heat that comes from the sun. And it is the heat that CO2 gets trapped in the atmosphere. The second step, it's called carbon fixation, in which the plant uses that chemical energy that obtained from water splitting to trap a molecule of CO2 and to embed it as part of its structure. Uh, so this process, it's very inefficient to store energy. It's just about 2%. But it's just enough to make plants live and to populate the earth and to remove the CO2 from the air. Now what we want to achieve is a material in which we can combine both steps as a single process that we call direct carbon reduction, in which a material will pick up a particle of light and transfer all that energy to a molecule of CO2. And then that CO2 can get transformed in another chemical that has more energy, that is a fuel that we can burn, a solar fuel, because it was created with energy that came directly from the sun. Now, there are out there many artificial photosynthesis materials that are very efficient. The challenge is that required to use very rare and very expensive elements, like platinum. Platinum is very rare. And one pound of platinum costs more than $10,000, which I guess is OK for wedding rings or tennis bracelets, but not to do artificial photosynthesis at the large industrial scale. Uh, so what we try to do in my lab is we try to make materials that are composed of elements that are more abundant, that are much less expensive. And I'll take our inspiration on white paint. And if there is any artist or a painter in the room, you will recognize this color. It's called titanium white. The pigment in this color, it's a crystal called titanium dioxide. And it is a material that can perform artificial photosynthesis through direct carbon reduction. Now the challenge is that to do this process, it requires ultraviolet light, which is only 3% of what comes from the sun. And it's also a very slow process. So it is also not economically viable to use this material at the large scale. However, it's a very inexpensive element. It's very abundant. One pound 
of titanium dioxide cost only seven cents. And it is literally dirt cheap, <laughs> especially if we compare it to platinum. So what we do in my lab, my students and I, we put together titanium with molecules that are able to capture different colors of the light. And we assemble them into these type of materials that we call frameworks. that are kind of like tinker toys, but with molecules that form these beautiful three-dimensional architectures that has a lot of holes, so then the CO2 can pass through really fast. Uh, in reality, the material looks like this. It's a yellow powder, and it is yellow because it absorbs blue light, and yellow is a complementary color of blue. Uh, so we put it in this little bottle. We add some chemicals. We bubble it with CO2, and we put it in this photoreactor that looks like a tanning bed, but it's made out of LED, blue LEDs. Uh, we use blue LEDs because they're very accessible, and they simulate very well different colors of the light. Right, so as a molecule of CO2 is passing through the framework, uh, it gets transformed, uh, the material picks up a particle of light, and transfers all that energy to the CO2, and then the CO2 gets turned into a solar fuel, and it leaves the material. And what we were able to see in our first study is that we can do this at rates much faster than titanium dioxide. So it is very promising. And we know that we can implement all these materials in current technology. So modern power plants, after they burn fuel and produce electricity, they have to process all the gases because some of them are very polluting. So as CO2 get also gets purified, at the very end gets either released to the atmosphere or pumped on the ground. So it is here where Inca can implement our artificial photosynthesis system. Because uh, we, we can turn all that CO2 back into a solar fuel so that they can feed it back onto the plant and we can achieve two things. First, we increase the efficiency of the plant because we can produce more electricity so we can actually make a profit using artificial photosynthesis. And second, that since we are reducing our own carbon we are producing electricity without emitting it, achieving a carbon neutral process. So we can use artificial photosynthesis to produce electricity in a carbon neutral process. That is sounds so cool. <laughs> um, but uh, of course our materials is not, are not perfect. Uh, there is a lot of optimization that we have to do. We want to be able to use more colors of the light, we want to make this at much faster rates and have higher efficiencies than photosynthesis. So there are a lot of experiments to do, and we're really excited about it. Uh, but we learned a couple of things. Uh, we learned how is the machinery of how our artificial photosynthesis materials work. So we know how to make them better. We know that we can create new science that can help us to adapt to climate change, and then we can fight it, and then we can make a profit. We learn also that we can go beyond photosynthesis, that we can make frameworks with all the elements of the periodic table, and we can use them to explore new properties, to discover new unknown phenomena, that we can make atoms and molecules organize exactly the way we want them. And I know that I am already nerding out really hard in here, <laughs> but uh, this is the kind of things that we chemists dream about. Uh, of course, I cannot do any of this alone. I need to rely on the younger generation of people. So we need to make science and technology more attractive. So what we do is that we bring students to our labs. We do science demonstrations like we do every year in our STEM day. We go to the schools and we organize activities like the national crystal growing competition that we do every year. So the students can do the experiments themselves. So they can understand science and see how fascinating it is. We also need to make science and technology more diverse. So we work with the Alliance for Diversity in Science and Engineering, a national nonprofit organization that brings together students and faculty from all backgrounds. Because diversity enriches us, and it is what makes America great. We need to encourage our children to be curious, to ask questions, so they can become the scientists and the engineers of the future. Like my students in my research groups, they are the ones that are mixing the chemicals, making the materials, and testing the photosynthesis. They are the ones 
who are going to make the new scientific discovery, the new technological advancement, so that with them, together, we can solve this problem of global warming. Because guess what? We need their help. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the National Science Foundation.